Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. Um, today's a, uh, we are continuing our series on uh, Bucky Fuller of uh, on Bucky. Um, so I'm sorry, I have to tell you a really uh, uh, you know bad news. Um, CJ is in a very bad shape. Uh, he is he has a fourth stage uh, cancer. And he has only a few weeks left. And that is the reason that we launched this series. Uh, this is a series on collaborating for comprehensivity. That is the vision that has shaped everything that um, CJ has done. And um, that is exactly what we are going to do with this. Buckminster Fuller is one of the greatest examples of comprehensivity. He's the core thinker that has been the influence for CJ. And so we decided, you know, uh, it was Joe, Maritza, and I, and then um, Rupali joined us. So four of us are leading this series. Um, when CJ knew that he was sick, the first thing and pretty much the only thing on his mind um, was to continue the work that he had started on comprehensivity. This is his vision that if a human, human being is comprehensivist, that means that the, he is the way in which Bucky describes it is macro comprehensive and micro incisive. One who can talk to anybody, talk to any field, take in any field as his own, and then be able to apply it powerfully to anything that they are focused on. That is a good thing. Bucky believed that and CJ believes that. And we are going to learn about that. We have been doing that for the past. I mean, the, um, you know, um, CJ has been doing meetups with the Greater Philadelphia Thinking Society for over 10 years. Before that, he's been involved in the Synergetic Collective. He's been involved with Bucky work for decades, at least I think three decades or so. So he has a long base on that. And then he's done a number of meetups on Bucky theme at 52 Living Ideas. Bucky is a profound thinker. His ideas are unified and they are applicable to everything, every human endeavor. We have studied him at one level. We want to take it to a new level, but we want to do that while keeping it accessible to anybody who wants it. That is the challenge. I'm happy to report that number of people who are really deep into Bucky, even before we have announced what has happened with CJ, many of them have come forward, very excited about pursuing that. I've already set up the first four meetups of January. We are going to use the four on-ramps that CJ has identified. We're going to do something, we're going to focus on the deepest intuitions that Bucky has and no better place to go than Bucky himself for that. So we're going to be going through critical path. That's going to be the yellow week. I have to use the tetrahedron. Bucky meetup will not be, will not be complete without that. So that's going to be the yellow. That's going to be the first week, okay? The second week, we are going to shift to blue deep ideas of Bucky. So this time 
we are going to have Peter Meiser presenting on some idea of uh, Bucky. He's been at it for a long time and he's been applying those ideas to the field of energy. So we'll see what we do. So that's going to be the second. Um, so first Saturday, uh, first Sunday is first. So we're going to skip that. After that, there are going to be four, uh, four Sundays. So on the eighth, we're going to have, we're going to launch Critical Path book discussion. I encourage you to read Critical Path and join us. Second after that is going to be Peter. The third after that is going to be a discussion like this. So we will take one idea and that is this, you know, communication, building a camaraderie, building a community is critical to learning, to comprehensivity. Collaboration and comprehensivity actually go together. So we are going to keep it open. We're going to take an idea like comprehensivity here and we're going to have a discussion. And finally, we're going to have a green one, which is actually demonstration of what it looks like. So there I have uh, Kirby um, and he's going to be presenting. He's been, he has amazing deck uh, of uh, slides. So we're going to have that. And I encourage anybody who, who knows about, who knows ideas of Bucky to uh, reach out to me at uh, 52 livingideas at gmail.com. And we will schedule. I will also be reaching out to a number of Bucky scholars uh, to, to add to this. So that is the project that we are doing. And that is why we are doing it. By the way, this is actually exactly in line with what 52 Living Ideas is and what we have been doing all along. We are pursuing a comprehensivity path. Um, and Bucky, and we've done this for Louis Sullivan. We did the design way um, with Harold. Uh, we've been looking at different works of different times, like Bhagavad Gita, like Gospel of John, like Tao Te Ching. We're trying to learn comprehensivity from there. And we will continue. So Bucky is only the latest of, of this series. Um, now I'm going to um, have uh, Joe. Would you like to add anything? Um, just briefly. Um, we're all here because of CJ. Um, his love for comprehensivism, his love for teaching, his love for learning. And um, I just want to share a really quick story that I think that demonstrates how passionate he is uh, about this work and uh, what this platform means to him. Um, as Srigant had noted, about four weeks ago, uh, he found out he had a number of tumors. Uh, it, the cancer has progressed. Uh, it is a very aggressive form. And he's in the process now of evaluating his options, whether to receive treatment or not. One of the main factors on whether he decides to receive treatment is whether or not he can finish the 27th essay in his series. He's making a decision. He says, if it impairs my thinking, then I don't want the treatment. I want to finish the essay. That's how much this series means to him. And that's how much teaching and learning and sharing means to us. He, he, um, and that's what makes 52 living ideas, 52 living ideas. Uh, so thank you, Srikant, for giving CJ the platform. And, you know, thank you for CJ. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Joe. Uh, next up is Maritza. Um, so uh, CJ often says to us, you know, he reminds us that the center of Bucky's definition of universe is uh, communicated experience. So um, 
I will just look forward and invite you all to look forward and walk forward with me. And we shall, all of us together, ensure that um, CJ stays alive because he's going to be alive in all of us. And this series will be that candle that we're all holding as we walk forward. And our meaningful path is going to become enmeshed with these concepts. And hopefully we will continue for years and years to ignite many different candles for collaborating for comprehensivity because every time we use that phrase, we're inviting someone or some people to keep CJ's vision alive. And the very foundation of so many of his concepts and the foundation of collaborating for comprehensivity sits with Buckminster Fuller's ideas. And so this is an honor for me to be a part of this. And I look forward to working um, with all of you. I think the, um, the four um, outlined uh, paths that CJ gave us, as always, he gives us a fantastic foundation to just take and move forward with. So um, through this sadness and heavy heart, I choose to look forward and I'm excited to um, embark on this path. And uh, so I just gently remind everyone that we are, um, we will be walking forward in some way with him. Thank you. Thank you, Marissa. Um, all right. So now we begin. Um, you're welcome to talk about comprehensivity that you see in this group, in CJ and Bucky, all of it put together. So we're going to go with uh, Robert, Rupali, and Jordan next. Um, Robert, go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> I learned about uh, CJ's situation earlier and I uh, want to express my thoughts a little bit. Um, you know, CJ is an ideal designer in the sense that he uh, can interpret Bucky's comprehension in a way that uh, makes it understandable to others. But he also, I think, has expanded on it much beyond what Bucky's words themselves have said. So uh, he... CJ will be long remembered because of that, if nothing else. Uh, and of course, as we go forward with this, uh, we'll always be able to uh, refer back to him. And uh, that's as good a memory as you can probably have. Uh, regarding Bucky and comprehensiveness, uh, <clears throat> I first listened to Bucky in the early 60s when I was in college and I couldn't believe it. Honestly, I had to go to the bathroom, but I didn't because once he started, you couldn't leave. And it, I remember the first time he started talking about sailing and I thought, oh, here we go. What's this all about? And we climbed on a sailboat and we talked about everything in the world and went around the world while we were talking, while he was talking, while we were listening and came back to the same spot we started in. And how he did that, I don't know, but we didn't stay in the, on, on the water for the whole trip. We went through the whole universe on the circumferential uh, journey and it took a while but it was worth every minute of it <clears throat> but the thing that that impressed on me was synergetics <clears throat> and at the time I didn't really get the connection between synergy and 
and systems that came later on. In fact, much later on. But I, I really got attuned to synergy because that seemed to make a lot of sense, especially when you've just heard the guy tell you about everything in the universe in two or three hours. And um, that always stuck with me. So it, it actually changed my worldview almost instantly in that I began to look at the world as a holism rather than parts and pieces and how I could uh, use my profession as architecture uh, to um, implement that. And as it turned out, our school was very uh, sympathetic to that approach. And my, uh, I don't wanna sound like this is all about me, but my senior or fifth year thesis thesis for the uh, architecture school was um, an implementation of one of Bucky, Bur Bucky's uh, tensegrity ideas. And um, I passed, which was pretty good news. But it had that impact that stuck with me. And, and over the years since, I've reinterpreted, revisited, uh, modified, added on, and then ran into CJ. And uh, tough. I'll leave it at that. I'll be back. Trikant, you're on mute. Uh, sorry, uh, next up is uh, Rupali. So thank you very much. Um, I wasn't aware of CJ's health. Uh, I knew he wasn't doing well, but I didn't realize the, the complexity. So I'm very sorry to hear about it. Um, Sorry, Rupali, I, I, we just got the permission today to tell people. No, that, that's... Sorry you know, about not telling you earlier. No, no, that's, that's absolutely all right. Mm -hmm. um, so my introduction to Buckminster Fuller was right uh, out when I was uh, probably in my fourth year of architecture. And I was doing my internship with... Uh, civil engineer in India. And uh, we were designing geodesic domes for housing in, in a rural area of India. And the spaces that were created inside the geodesic domes were very different from the spaces that you see in a rectangular uh, cuboid that, that we are very familiar with. And the light, that you can get in because of the openings in triangular triangular openings in a geodesic dome is you know the play of light is very different from that of getting light from um, rectangular windows or square windows that are pretty much just uh, perpendicular to the floor so that was a very fascinating uh, project i uh, worked on. And that's how I, I got familiar with Buckminster Fuller and his work and started reading about it. Um, then when I came to the US, uh, there was an exhibition of the Dimaction car at the Rockefeller Center in New York. And uh, I was just amazed to see how beautiful that car was. And they had one model of it um, so the whole idea about Buckminster Fuller and comprehensivity, you know, uh, he was an architect, he was a philosopher, he was uh, 
writer. He was um, a mathematician. Um, he loved to teach. He, as an architect, he was a visionary. He could see. Um, he, he could he could see the big picture. And then he also had the gift of breaking it into parts and was detail-oriented. So in terms of comprehensivity and in terms of the 52 living ideas, um, I think Buckminster Fuller uh, is a great role model. At 52 living ideas, um, there is a desire to learn uh, to, to see similarities between various uh, fields, various philosophies, and make sense of the world that we live in. One of Buckminster Fuller's goals was to make, um, to contribute to humanity and do more with less. Uh, so I think in that regard, um, the 52 Living Ideas and Buckminster Fuller, they, uh, they go hand in hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rupali. Uh, I have to tell you a little story. Uh, you're talking about the inside of the geodesic dome. Like most people think of geodesic domes from outside. But really the purpose of it is inside. And I was talking to um, Harold Nelson and, uh, you know, today, and I was asking him about comprehensivity. He says, you know, most people are looking at the elephant and they get only pieces of it. You know, somebody sees the leg, but a comprehensivist means that you have to get the whole elephant. And um, so I said, yes, great comprehensivist like Bucky uh, or Louis Sullivan, when they're designing a space, they design it for the elephants that are there in the room and elephants that they don't see in the room. So it's all designed for, for that, so everything. So thank you, thank you, Rupali. Um, next up is going to be Jordan. Jordan, uh, what do you think about the comprehensivity of Buckminster Fuller? First, first off, I'd, I'd like to express um, heartfelt thoughts and sentiments for CJ. Um, I only have a cursory brief glimpse of him. I mean, just coming, you know, into experience recently. And from, I have to say that from that brief glimpse, um, it feels that he lives con comprehensivity and that further, he doesn't, and even just the way he communicates he hasn't been incapacitated by the either or crap of rationality. He, he looks at reason as a utility, as a tool. And one of the, honestly, thank you, Rapali, many facets in, of the interior dome of a geodesic dome, which to me feels to be a view of the multifaceted psyche from within, as if there's a tetrahedron of the four functions in every triangle. And they each interact differently and they each purport themselves differently. And they also sometimes lie dormant differently. And I have to say, you know, Robert, I have the same or similar brain damage to you, um, a five-year degree in architecture and an architect for 30 years. But I, I discovered Bucky in the second semester of my fourth year in a five-year program. So, the first semester of the fifth year, I have programming for my thesis coming up. And so, you know, I didn't know what I wanted to do for my thesis. I didn't know, I didn't know, I didn't know until a three hour lecture where Bucky was just shown in snippets and pieces and complete speeches by the um, research methods professor. He said, today we're gonna have a little field trip and I don't give a damn about logic this you need to have inside your reasoning. And he just shut up and hit play. Well, 
what happened, that was the form giver for my thesis because I didn't know what I wanted to do because I didn't know that what I wanted to do was illegal. It was verboten in the College of Architecture. I wanted to do a house. And you know that's allegedly too complex for a student to do. Well, once I realized then the word home came and the infinitive to dwell and indwelling with Carl Jung, et cetera, I went, oh, well, I've had 11 grade appeals and I've gone 11 for 11. So I'm going to go for 12 for 12. I'm going to go for the big one and I'm going to do a house. Well, it took about three days, which I thought was pretty short to just Gandhi them out. You know, I, I just would not have any of it. But it was because of that three hours of Bucky the semester before where I had a whole summer to steep in it. And they said, well, a house is then too simple. And I said, well, you haven't asked me the theme. And the theme is like the, in Henry Pali, the interior of a geodesic dome. I'm going to do the temple in man, my psyche turned inside out called home. And ended up calling it pluribus out of the many one. But it was the temple in man, which I hadn't discovered Schwaller to Lubish or Lovezor at that point. But I have to say what's wild is that three hour lecture threw me into the immersion pool of the not knowing of comprehensivity and all the synapses in between in con comprehensivity. And I quickly, rationally found the tool of, look, when I have a thought, there's a neuron that fires, leap of faith style over the many Nietzschean abyss of the synapse. Well, the not knowing is 50% of that equation. And when I make the connection, when that electricity lands, the not knowing, the void, that heartfelt space between, it's still a full one third of the process. And so what I realized there is, like the, my brief experience of CJ here, um, that Bucky lives, and I think lives in those of us that resonate with him as a living symbol of wholeness, except then that started to feel vague to me. And I went, oh, well, it's not either or. It's not that, you know, limiting rationality, utility, which is pretty like a you know, surrogate parent. Who are you trying to explain yourself to? What's the heart of the matter? And what I realized is that, that the both and, the Fred Astaire, Ginger Rogers of Bucky was his living verb of comprehensivity. And I think in that, you know, it was the ability to, to literally work his process in such a way that the caterpillar literally did, you know, nothing about the caterpillar's life told him anything about the butterfly. Yet one day he would just climb up that twig and he would make his new shell, his egg. He would literally liquefy. It didn't go on, you know, the butterfly, the caterpillar doesn't go on a, on a diet and lose some legs and grow some wings, literally liquefy and then reconstitute as a butterfly. And then especially important with Bucky, he didn't waste trouble. More than discipline, it was heart of the matter, blissipline. And I think in that blissipline, that's the butterfly backing out of the chrysalis, struggling. Well, it's a very Uranian growth development individuation concept there where Saturn, the status quo, just is the eggshell. And in the struggle of Bucky's process, he would repeatedly, consistently push out of the chrysalis, which pushes the liquid into the wings. And like a crab that shed its skin or its shell would then reharden within as a new structure. And so my, um, I can't, think to close close out there and not go on too long mm -hmm. my my laughable as it was some people have lunchables i'd rather have laughables and um i think was that simply um don't then this to me feels directly inspired from bucky's comprehensivity uh, probably with critical path as its hidden structure within is be fluid but don't go with the flow. Only dead fish go with the flow. 
unless at times when they relax to get a free effortless ride downstream to a new spot where they resume being fluid, turning upstream and not going with the flow. And I think that um, that example, I love that Rupali brought up the interior of the geodesic dome because a friend of mine built one outside of town and college. And I said, well, you know, harmonics are impart important. What if we change the materials on different triangles? What if we literally musically try to tune this space so that when you walk in, you change? You are lit literally in a living space that's playing its own silent music, so to speak. And so I'll, I'll stop there, I think. Thank but you. it's comprehensivity. Um, the both and feels to be the living verb. And I think the noun to describe it I, is what I call FICP, one long hyphenated word, functionally interrelated component parts, one word that has a both and as its very implementation at every step. And if there's not that at every step, it's a fish scale or chaff to be blown off in the wind from wheat. So I think Bucky is one of the best mentors. Um, and actually, I feel his work yep. is strong enough to be a living symbol, and which is generative rather than completion oriented. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, beautiful. Thank you very much. Uh, next up is going to be Rupali. And then I want to ask the fourth architect in the house, uh, Jeng, if she wants to add anything. Rupali, go ahead. I just want to add to what Jordan mentioned just now. Uh, Bucky himself did not consider uh, himself as just a noun. He said he was a verb, he was action. And I think that's something to remember is that we are here to act on this world and not just be present as things on the earth. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Rupali. Um, Jeng, would you like to add anything? Um, otherwise we're going to go to Tom. Jen, go ahead. Oh, sorry, I just, uh, just listening. So okay, that's, that's fine. Ahead. That's fine. Okay. Uh, if at a later point you want to talk about um, Bucky and comprehensivity, you're welcome to do that. Uh, let's go to Tom now. Tom, go ahead. Um, thank you, Shriken. I didn't know you were gonna, gonna call on me, but I just made some notes. I won't be more than two minutes. Sure. Um, but as I said the last time and the only time that I might even knew about this group. I mean, in the late 60s, um, I read almost everything by Bucky that was almost 50 years ago. Um, for more than 45 years, I just went on to other things. And just recently, right, that was rekindled. Um, I just want to comment on some of the things said by um, by Rupali, he clearly saw the big picture when he explained doing more with less. The concept that that between 1900 and 1983, 60% of all humans in America lived like royalty did in the 1900s was 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 so optimistic that I became so um, confident that humanity <laughs> will somehow make it. Uh, so now having not read him for over 45 years, I could see he was such a futurist, so far ahead of his time. Um, <laughs> that, I mean, he was so logical. Um, I just hope somehow humanity, you know, comes through the concepts that it seemed like these things are all happening, you know, by themselves. Um, so I just put one sentence in the chat of how in one sentence, Bucky defines universe as physical and metaphysical, the aggregate of all humanity's conscious, apprehended and communicate experience. For me, that just summed up everything. 
So I think I should listen to all of you who are more knowledgeable. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Um, let's, uh, anybody else who wants to add about um, comprehensivity, anybody who has not spoken yet, go ahead and type an exclamation mark. Now I'm going to open it up for anybody who wants to talk about comprehensivity of Buckminster Fuller. Um, many of us are familiar, many of us have heard about Buckminster Fuller through CJ. So we've kind of started something. We did an entire, uh, we went through the operations manual for Spaceship Earth. Um, actually, what we're going to do, we've got two more meetups left this year. Um, the first one, we're going to do um, a review of operations manual. So any comments you have on operations manual. And the one after that, we're going to be discussing what you got from Critical Path. If you have read it, you're welcome to share. For both these books, you're welcome to share what you got from these books. The Critical Path one is critical because that's what we're going to be studying all next year. Okay, so uh, next up is going to be Cho. Cho, go ahead. So I'm going to be brief as well, um, but we've talked, and I, I mentioned this in the past, uh, a lot about what Bucky's inventions are, the Dimaxium car, the Dimaxium house, and all these things. Uh, and you have to ask yourself, how did he come up with these things? You know, what was it that enabled Bucky to do what he did? Um, and as I said previously, it was his ability to go beyond the obvious and to look at things in multiple dimensions. So the elephant example that you provided a little bit earlier that Harold Nelson provided, it's not only you know each individual seeing the elephant, just part of it, where you're seeing the whole elephant. And it allows you to create things that are lead to other creations. So the Dimaxium car was actually designed as in order to be a flying car at one point. Yeah, I mean, that's the type of thinking that forward type of thinking in his in his uh, that he had. Um, so the other aspect of it is that, you know, we went we, we had a session here the other night uh, where you took the tetrahedron and you applied it to MBTI uh, functions. And we talked about it you know, how people are strong in certain areas and they're not able to notice their weaknesses in some other areas. But when you put it, you know, in a tetrahedron, it's understanding the whole, you understand yourself. And that's one of the most important things. It's not only understanding the world around you, but it's also understanding yourself in that process. And Bucky's concepts apply to almost every discipline, to every discipline. Um, that you can take these the geometry of thought and his ideas, especially around cosmic accounting, is another one that I think is perhaps really powerful, where he talks about using energy as a way, as a form of accounting, as opposed to just using dollars and cents. And it's this type of thinking, this type of holistic type of thinking that that allows him to come up with new ideas and his ability to connect dots uh, in across multiple disciplines. And this is why he's he warns against uh, you know the the dangers of specialization that it leaves us in our silos to the point where we're no longer creative. Um, and we're only creating things for that what already exists. We're not creating things bringing new things into existence. So you really see a lot of the design way approach in Bucky's concepts as well. The other important thing I'll just add is that Bucky was always talked about the experience. That's the universe, essentially, our experiences, the total number of our experiences. And I think that there's something very important there is because the more experiences we have, the more aware we become and we're able to form intention. And that's being, you know, one of the things that we talked about in the past with the design way with intentional change. 
it's not only we have an experience, we have an understanding of the world. So our, whatever we do, whatever actions we take are based on us, us being open and having more experiences. So I think that that's just for me, some just some of the concepts uh, that Bucky has, you know, I, I, we could go on about ephemeralization and or all these other ones as well. But just as far as comprehensivity goes, I think that this is uh, this is one of the you know one of the main things is that uh, his ability to see beyond what already exists. Wonderful. So I want to get many people's thought on the table, even if you uh, know. Uh, Bucky, only a little bit, go ahead and put your thoughts on the table, because what we are trying to do here is to have a conversation so that everybody can grasp what, you know, what these ideas are. I want to talk about, um, let's see, I think Chad has something. Uh, let's see, Chad, go ahead. Um, would you like to comment about, oh, just a second, I'm going to allow, would you like to comment about the comprehensivity of Buckminster Fuller? Yes, um, I'd like to thank CJ for putting this group together and, and welcome me, welcoming me into it. Um, I sent him an introductory email. He answered all my uh, entry-level questions on Bucky. Um, and when you get finished reading Synergetics and you start going on Google to find out what it's all about, um, CJ's name is the, is the first thing that's popped up. Um, so he should be very proud of um, being a leader and putting this group together. Um, we're all here for him um, if he needs us. Um, as far as, as uh, Bucky goes, I think Synergetics really speaks for itself and speaks for Bucky in his own language. And um, his language connected with me, um, but I know that it doesn't connect with everyone. So it's up to us to, to translate that. And, um, you know, synergetics, I see it as a model for the universe, um, straight to the physical and structures, um, stability, um, all the way to the to um, metaphysical, which is which is just chaos, anything. Um, and, and so once you breach those two areas, um, they don't like to mix. The scientists don't want to enter the metaphysical and the, and the spiritual don't want to enter the, the physical. So um, looking that all together um, may, makes it a very different work um, from anything else you, you've ever read. Um, so there's a lot to be built upon that, um, and I'm I'm an engineer, so I look to to bring it into practice. How can we make this um, a practical thing and and bring it into the world? Um, so I'm excited to be a part of this project. So thank you. Wonderful, thank you, thank you, uh, Chad. Um, folks, people who have not spoken before will get uh, priority because I want to get as many voices in the table at this point. So it'll be uh, Vanessa next. Vanessa. Well, to be honest, I know more about Bucky by uh, um, CJ applying it in real life. Um, and even like I remember he would be talking about Bucky, this and that, like Buck, wait, it's just Buck, Mr. Fuller, he's this Bucky, and you're putting two and two together. But even how he would um, approach uh, projects and topics and even challenging things that maybe he had been taught even up through undergraduate level. And he would like everyone um, speak out what they had to say. And he would challenge, but not in an argumentative way. If anything else, okay, maybe I don't agree with what you're saying, but give me a more thorough explanation. Let me appreciate where you're coming from. And, you know, he would let everyone, you know, speak on the floor. And sometimes you could tell someone may be very attached to position. In some cases, I may have drawn the same conclusion after the end of a discussion, but I had a completely different way of getting to it after everything was all said and done. But, you know, he's very thorough, respectful, and, you know, he's even willing to challenge his own things, saying, oh, well, wait a minute, we found this happened, and after re-examining this or in light of what you said, and realizing, you know, you're never gonna know it all, and just sometimes you learn more by appreciating the other around you. And like even having, in that sense of humor, and being able to laugh at yourself. 
But like I said, you know, he exemplified it and is exemplifying it. So like I said, he kind of introduced him to me. I may have not, I may know some of the concepts. I just didn't realize, you know, the word or the technical behind and who it um, can be a, a, not attributed to. Lose, I'm losing track of my words here. But yeah, and best wishes, positive energy, thoughts to CJ and everyone in his family and close circle of friends. I unfortunately, just learned of this today. So my heart is heavy. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Vanessa. Thank you. Really appreciate that. Um, right. Um, so I want to say one thing about uh, Bucky's comprehensivity. Uh, the most dramatic example of his comprehensivity that I found was in the operating manual to Spaceship Earth, the first chapter itself, where he talks about the pirates, the great pirates. Um, I think I still think that it is one of the most powerful metaphors that I have seen about understanding comprehensivity. He says, most people live on land and they lived, I mean, we're talking about historical times. They lived and they didn't go more than like 10 miles, 25 miles from their home. So all they knew was around them. And rest of the rest, everything was unknown and inaccessible to them. And then there came these pirates, great pirates, who made sea their own and realized that sea connects, connects all land. So they can go to various places and then they can travel a little bit on land to get to most places that they need to get to. So suddenly their vision of what is there and more, what is possible through combinations of those things was at a level orders of magnitude higher than those people who were in their little silos. And that's what, you know, you can transport it to modern day, you know, all knowledge is in different silos. And there are very few people that are going between the silos. So that going between the silos, which are separated from one another, the physical metaphor of a pirate, great pirates is beautiful way of capturing that. It also highlights that you need to figure out the navigating mechanism. You need to figure out, uh, you know, you need to have the stomach to take the risk. You need to plan for, you have to be open to meeting people whom you don't know and be able to deal with it if it turns out to be a negative experience and be able to make the most of it, it turns out to be positive experience. You have to let go of your comfort of the known in order to venture into the unknown. And all of that, that entire mindset is the, is the pirate mindset. And I find that to be just a beautiful, beautiful way of uh, thinking about uh, comprehensivity. Um, so next up is going to be Rupali, followed by Jordan. Uh, Rupali. So I just wanted to add um, to what I had said before. You know, one of the things about um, Buckminster Fuller was uh, looking at nature. And he, he said, one of his quotes was, nature is trying to uh, trying hard to help us succeed, but nature is not depend on, dependent on us. We are not the only experiment. And he talked about how it was important for, for humans to understand nature so that we could live in nature. And um, I think that again ties back to what we are studying in Bhagavad Gita or Tao, um, Tao Te Ching, that, you know, uh, being part of nature and the big difference in that is where Buckminster Fuller is talking about the action and he's not afraid of technology. He's like, okay, we need technology. We need to keep moving forward, but with the understanding of nature. 
and um, that that uh, harmony between nature and human existence is what we saw even in Louis Sullivan's writings and Louis Sullivan's work. Um, the other thing, you know, something that was similar to what Steve Jobs had said is um, when he invented um, new products, he invented them and then waited for people to understand and apply those inventions. And similarly, Buckminster Fuller was way ahead of his times and um, he didn't wait for people to tell him what they needed. He just invented things and then uh, waited for people to, to get there. <laughs> so I, those, I wanted to add that. Wonderful, thank you. And we'll have a comment from um, from uh, Marissa followed by Jordan. And then uh, if anybody who has not had a chance to comment, please go ahead and type exclamation mark after these two comments or any other comment, anybody who has not commented before, we are going to go into the questions mode. So please put on the table any questions you would like to ask about the comprehensivity of Buckminster Fuller. Maritza. Um, one of, uh, to me, a fascinating aspect of uh, Buckminster Fuller's uh, concept of comprehensivity is the the manner in which he puts an equal importance into um, viewing things or systems through the lens of the whole after having looked at it through the lens of the parts. Um, and, you know, that was, a, a, a CJ has an essay, well, he has several essays, but he has one, the whole shebang, it's, um, it was one that uh, I, I had to come back to several times before I fully understood the manner in which he was stating it. Um, and actually some of uh, Buckminster Fuller's words, actual words are what helped um, because I read that um, Bucky believes that it's, you know, it's, at, it's so important to um, always pull back to see the big picture after you go down and you get into details. But, and he says that after stating that it's super vital to go down and, and see things in the parts. Um, and I, I have a, a quote I had written down of his and it says, having, however, started from as comprehensive a basis as possible, I never really lose the fundamental comprehensivity and I can come back really quite rapidly from any subject. Um, and I, I view that as um, something to, you know, as, aspire to with most things that one encounters. I, I think that that's is a great goal of a button comprehensivist. And, and I think that one statement does a pretty good job of helping to show some of what the question we're being asked today is, right? It's, it asks, you know, what is um, Buckminster Fuller's comprehensivity look like? And I, I see that as an aspect of it. Um, there's so many more, but for me, that one just speaks really loudly because I think that we live in a very specialized culture or a culture that um, values specialization to a point where it's becoming a fault and it's becoming at the expense of our ability to pivot to and to do exactly this, the, this telescoping um, aspect that um, Bucky describes is something that we all need to get better at. And it's through no fault of our own. It's the society in which we live does not, you know, advocate for this type of dancing. So we have to, all of us get some new shoes and try it out. And, um, you know, I think that as we go forward um, together, looking at it, we'll, we'll all um, get a little bit stronger at that. Uh, she can't in one of our, um, comprehensivist Mon Wednesdays, he made a comment about um, the uh, the idea of us, um... oh my gosh, I totally just, lo just lost the thought. Sorry, sorry, um, <laughs> that's terrible. It... 
that's all right. You can you I can apologize. come back. You can come back. You can yes. So sorry. Exclamation mark. The the magic exclamation mark works. Even if you forget something, you can go back and you get it. Get okay. the exclamation mark. I will. I'm so sorry. Yes. Terrible. Generally, whenever there is a, a flash of the word, you can either put a flash or exclamation mark. Both count the same. Uh, let's go with Howard followed by uh, Jordan. Howard. Yeah. Um, I'm kind of sitting at everybody's feet in, in learning. I've uh, done a little bit of uh, reading in uh, Buckminster Fuller's writings a long time ago. Uh, but um, I just wanted to, to say that um, I haven't had a chance to attend many of CJ's uh, meetups, um, but the ones I attended uh, really challenged my thinking and made me think in some new directions. So um, I just want to say thank you to CJ for that growth. Um, and otherwise, I'll listen. Thank you. Thank you, Howard. Really, really appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, next up is going to be Jordan. Jordan, go ahead. And then, folks, we are going to go to Q&A. So keep your questions ready. Uh, go ahead, Jordan. Yes. To be to be short, and just three quick points to address your pirate and Maritz's telescoping. But first, to me, simply from a structural engineering standpoint, and from the perspective of the four psychological functions, it's interesting to me that architecturally, the tetrahedron is itself its own foundation, which that support piece is, I think, so key um, to talk about the pirate you know, freedom from the known, the exploration, but with tools and with skills. And it always perplexed me why so many pirates with patches on their eye. And I thought, well, what a goofy job description. Every time a rope snaps, you have to lean in and try to get whipped in the eye so you lose one to be a member of the club. That doesn't make any sense. And I dug a little deeper only the pirates, except the ones that have actually lost an eye, only the pirates that work on deck and also below deck wear patches. And what happens is when they start to descend the steps, they switch it over and that eye is already adjusted to the dark. So that to me completely segues to Maritz's telescoping concept where like Bucky, they're able to shift focus and redirect scale in an instant seamless segue. So period, I think those just three pieces seem to just kind of one, two, three foundation patch and telescoping go together. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Jordan. Uh, next up, we're going to go to questions. So um, any, any questions you would like to raise on comprehensivity, on Bucky, what we are planning in this series, any questions, let's go, um, you just go ahead and type an exclamation mark if you'd like to raise any questions. Uh, let's start with Joe. Joe, go ahead. I think uh, one of the interesting questions to explore is um, what can derail comprehensivity? I think you have to think about the opposite. You know, what are the things that are obstacles to comprehensivity and how are they overcome? Excellent, excellent question. Folks, more questions. Questions are far more important than answers. So, um, Rupali. So my question is, uh, we, we all agree that Buckminster Fuller was a man of the future. The future is here. Um, so what are we doing with his ideas now? And are we efficient as he had hoped humanity would be? Wonderful, excellent, excellent question. Thank you. Um, Anybody else? Go ahead and type exclamation mark. We'd like at least three or four questions on the table, and then we will try to take all of them and have discussion on it.
So we got so far, you know, what are obstacles to comprehensivism? Let's uh, go with Robert next. Robert, go ahead. Um, I don't know how to put this in a quick question, but comprehensivity implies a vast amount of knowledge and information. We know we can't put all that to work. So how do we treat the immensity of comprehensivity? Beautiful. How do we manage the immensity of comprehensivity? Okay. Uh, anybody else? Last chance. Going, going, gone. Go ahead. Howard, you had a question. Uh, I did. Um, yeah. Um, despite um, what uh, Bucky said about silos and people working in silos, is there anything positive that uh, can come out of silos that contributes to comprehensivity? Wonderful. Thank you. Wonderful. I think this is this is a great set of questions that we have. So let me try to uh, organize them and try to put it um, put it together here. So first, uh, and let's keep the question about uh, what is happening to ideas of Bucky for last. But all those other three questions, you can see that they are all connected. The first one. Um, is how do you handle the immensity of comprehensivity? Comprehensivism, comprehensivity means everything. How do you, at the same time, your consciousness is limited, your sight is limited, your senses are limited. How do you handle that? So that's one part. Um, the second one was, is there anything positive about the silos? And the third one is, what is what are the obstacles? to comprehensivity, okay? So let's start with the obstacles to comprehensivity. Okay, let me, let me think here, okay? So there is obstacles to comprehensivity. There is the value of silos. What is the value of silos? So let, let us do that first. Let's, you know, what is it that you get from silos? Because if there is, there are lots of silos, there are some reasons why they are there. Now we can talk about whether they are valid reasons or invalid reasons. Why are there silos? What does it give you? Okay, because comprehensivity can be understood on the basis of that. So then we can talk about, you know, the uh, the silos. Why do silos exist? I'll, I'll put it like that. Why do silos exist? Then we will go to what are the obstacles of doing that if we come to that. And then the next last question, would be uh, how do we handle the immensity? So that's the structure. Okay, um, so now I'm happy to, to, Joe, you wanted to do the answer to the why silos exist or did you want to put one more question on the table? I was gonna answer. Okay, go ahead. Um, one of the things that I think is the distinction between efficiency and effectiveness, right? Sometimes in, you're efficient, you know, you're saving time, you're saving money, you know, you're, you're doing something, uh, you're taking, uh, how should I say this, um, the path of least resistance. Uh, whereas if you're doing something of effective, you're looking at things like, what does it mean to be successful? You're not necessarily looking. So I, we kind of covered this with the OODA loop where people manage themselves to metrics as opposed to manage themselves to the project itself and that they don't necessarily that the metrics become the goal instead of the goal actually being whatever it is that they're trying to accomplish so it's it's, it's i think in a way when you get in this silo you start to say this is the cheapest way to do something and you have something that's already been established as well so the change the change is very hard as well so I think that that's where it is. And then I think sometimes uh, where as you start to, to, you manage yourself to your success is more short-term versus long-term. And that's what Bucky really kind of gets to is this idea of, he starts to think about things as in terms of regenerative. Like that's how he considers to be successful. How do you make a system regenerative 
versus actually how do you just get something done? Mm -hmm. And so I think that that's a really, that's the way I would approach to uh, that, that particular question. Wonderful, great. Um, so folks, the question on the table is why are there silos? Okay, uh, next up is going to be Jordan, followed by Robert. Jordan. Responding in a question to that, my question is, are silos simply places of confluence of specificities, knots or nodes to pour into comprehensivity? Okay. As a que question about that. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Jordan. Next up is Robert. Robert, why are there silos? Uh, um, silos are good and silos have problems. The good part of silos are they bring focus to an issue uh, with a opportunity for um, analytical reductionism to do its thing, which we need. But they also are contrary to systemic integration because silos by definition don't communicate from one with one another. So that uh, effort is lost. So they're a mixed bag, but they have their value and their value is very important. Wonderful, um, wonderful. While there, but uh, let's see, is there anything positive to contribute to comprehensivity? Uh, okay, that's that's fine. So now we'll come to comprehensivity. Now, we've so far we've talked about silos. Now let's look at comprehensivity. Um, why comprehensivity? And then you can also answer. Uh, so, okay, now given we, we've talked about silos, why have comprehensivity? So that's the, let's let's put that as a basic question, and then we will look at obstacles, and then we will look at managing its complexity. So why be comprehensive? Why be a comprehensivist? Go ahead and type exclamation mark if you would like to answer. Maritza, why? Why? Because the inside of the silo tends to be about twenty degrees cooler than the outside. <laughs> um, the so. <laughs> Sorry, that's that's what came to mind when you asked the question, because you asked it with the silos. But I believe that, you know, the comprehensive thinking allows one to consider that. Because who thinks about going inside to escape swelter and heat? Buckminster Fuller did and succeeded in, a, in his own way. So I think that's that's the prize to look at, the, the ability to have that kind of different thinking, so to maybe zag when everyone else is zigging. Wonderful, thank you. Next up is going to be Evanique, Joe, and Jordan. Evanique. I think the answer to the question of why be a comprehensivist is so that you don't lose sight of the bigger picture. And, you know, a lot of people go into their silo and they think of their one task and their one talent. And you may, we talked about this on Friday. Um, you know, like you have to know your, I, I, you have to know like your strengths and weaknesses because you may be strong in one area and weak in another and somebody else may be weak. But if you're, that's part of comprehensive thinking is that you may not know everything, but you know enough about something to say, I need help on this thing. And it provides collaboration, which I think CJ was going after. Um, unfortunately, I didn't get to know CJ that well, but what I knew of him is that comprehensive, comprehensivity and collaboration uh, was his passion. And the reason why is when you have people collaborate, you, everybody brings a different view to the table and that's comprehens comprehensivity. When you bring a different view to the table, it becomes a better picture. It's not just looking at the big picture, but it's also recreating that picture when needed. Like Maritza was saying, you know, Zach, 
the zagging when everybody else is zigging, you know. Uh, but also, I think an added element to that is to be able to tell people, you know, when you see the whole picture, hey, maybe some can zig and some can zag. I, I, I really think just think when you think of comprehensivity, is that everybody's bringing their view to the table, but we're all there to to have this common goal and to change the goal as needed. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, thank you, Evanique. Uh, next up is Joe followed by Jordan. Joe. Well, I mean, the first and uh, obvious answer is that it leads to creativity. Uh, so you're able to see things uh, that other people don't see. You're able to connect things that other people don't connect. Um, so that you're able to come up with ideas that make sense, that are coherent and complete. Um, so I think that that's the first thing. Uh, another is that I, I really think that um, if you're not a comprehensivist, you could very likely end up focusing on the forms and not the functions. And that's a very important point. You start to lose sight as to why you're doing something in the first place. So that you know you 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 know and then in that particular instance you may end up trying to hang on to that form and uh that is you know detrimental to both you and potentially the organization um there's a third point that i think that uh evanique had already spoken to uh as well it's just you know uh, basically losing you have sight of the big picture um, and, and I think that there's, there's also an added bonus to being a comprehensivist. That is, you're never, you're never done learning. I mean, you're always going to be learning. Uh, you're always going to be pushing forward. Uh, you never get tired of it. And, um, you know, there's a curiosity that exists within you and a zeal that exists within you that will never be satisfied. Uh, and I think that that's, um, you know, that gets into values and purpose and all those, and some of those deeper questions that we ask ourselves. So anyway, that's, that's. Thank you. Uh, next up is going to be Barbara, Jordan, and Vanessa. Barbara. Barbara, you need to unmute. Go okay, ahead. there we go. Okay, I'm sorry about that. Uh, one thing I think is uh, not mentioned in this discussion is the question of unforeseen consequences. And a universalist should be able to see not only the aspects of the current project and how it's going to be done, but the unintended consequences that might arise in the future. And how can we build in design to our project that is going to avoid these bad potential consequences. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Barbara. Uh, next up is going to be Jordan. Jordan, go ahead. I think why have comprehensivity? comprehensivity um, one, to keep the beautiful not knowing of curiosity and wonderment and discovery continually nourishing the specificity in the silos. Two, in a bigger picture, to keep the dignity and difference present where no need to agree to disagree. That's just a way to say, oh, I think you're full of BS and please stop your speaking. Um, the reality is disagreement is just fine and you don't need to resolve it. And I think then form follows priority third in form function. And I think in that, as Joe, Joe alluded to as well, we are each always complete, never finished, lifelong. And I think those are four bullet points of why comprehensivity. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Jordan. Next up is Vanessa. Well, why comprehensivity? It's one great way to prevent boredom. And sometimes just being exposed to something just because I'm, you know, I want to either listen to this talk or go to a concert of some sort of music I've never heard before. And it may motivate you or pique your curiosity. You dig deeper. You may, five years down the road, they may need it. And there could be, let's say, even um, 
in the education field, you may have a kid that loves music, but doesn't get fractions. But if you can make that connection, the beat, you know, the beat has a set rhythm. That's, you know, a unit of measure. Guess what? A unit of measure. That's also going to be, you know, four beats of measure. That's a quarter note. And that um, different way of either looking at things. And also, you know, it enhances your knowledge. And also, if you realize, well, comprehensive, you're never going to, just like you cannot think of the biggest number, because always think of one larger. You know, there's always going to be more information out there. And you can come to the table with new ideas. And it also means you're maybe more willing to hear somebody else's weather, just so I could have one more book in the bookshelf, so to speak. But like you said, you hear the people, maybe it's uh, willing to take the chance and experiment. And maybe being willing to fail to realize sometimes you learn so much more from the failure. If you got a oh, problem solved, well, okay, why do we have to come up with a better solution? Versus, okay, maybe the problem solved, but can you do it better? Or how can you tweak it? Or tell me how mine could be so much better. Or maybe why mine is so much more worse. Sometimes it's more of explanation and being able to analyze and critique it. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, all right. Um, so, you know, when I think about this question, I think um, I, um, I mean, for me, the profound thing was going through Bhagavad Gita, Gospel of John, and Tao Te Ching, because it gives, it gave me a grounding which was very different from modern grounding. The modern grounding regards whatever forms there are around you as given, as if they are the primary, whatever forms you see. The truth is that, and, and, and they regard comprehensivity, and comprehensivity is a big word, but it really means the whole. Okay, the modern world regards parts as primary. Comprehensivity regards whole as primary. So the fun, most fundamental reason is that it is, you know, it, it is. So the world is a whole. And that's why it is important to regard it as a whole because it is a whole. It is, parts come from it and they change. So it's like the Tao is the Tao and it produces 10,000 things. If you hold on to the, one of the 10,000 things, that's like you're holding on to a silo. You're holding on to concrete. You're holding on to something that was actually produced by the whole at one point of time, but you have forgotten connections to it. You have lost the connection to how it came to be. And you see this in field after field. Um, one, you know, one of the a couple that researches polymathy was here and they were saying, you know, we're trying to teach people how to be comprehensive. And you know, in the edu in education system, and you know what the hardest thing we have is the science teachers because they want to just communicate the results of science. Okay, that is a silo. And what they were saying, but you know, all those results were produced by a scientific method as a way of thinking. And if you have that, then all the forms are fluid in your hands. In attempt to master the forms that are there. you are losing the capacity of creating forms by yourself. And you are regarding forms that are already created as gods, as the idols that you're worshiping. <laughs> and you're losing the living principle that formed them. Um, so it is not an issue of practicality. It is an issue of truth. It is an issue of practicality, but more fundamentally, it is the issue of truth. So that is the yellow way of looking at it, that there is a principle, ultimate principle, 
that is governing it. That's why you have to be. That, that's why you should be comprehensivist. There is also the thinking <laughs> principle. You know, you are trying to induce from everything. You're trying to go back and forth between the deepest level. Somebody brought up spirit and matter. This view of comprehensivity that Louis Sullivan has, that Bucky has, Louis Sullivan has, has it most explicitly, unmistakably. Form ever follows the function. Function creates its own form. Silos are forms that have been created by somebody else. And if you choose to live inside the silo, you're saying forms will shape my function. And that's a sure way of killing your function. Um, so that, uh, that's how I approach comprehensivity. Um, now, what I want to do is before we go on to the next question, um, Doug is here. Uh, he is, you know, he has spent a lot of time with Bucky. He has produced um, one person play on the life of Bucky. Uh, so I want to ask uh, Doug what he thinks about the comprehensivity of, of Bucky. So anything you want to say, uh, Doug, please take your time. Uh, please go ahead and unmute. A long day for me, but it's good to see everybody here and uh, plug in for a little bit. I uh, um, have been in a number of meetings. Uh, the comprehensivity, uh, I think, Bucky, uh, I've gone, uh, I love talking to CJ about this because, you know, he'll throw something out and I'll throw something out and then he'll, he really does sort of live with the the changing feedback, and he really is grateful to get it. And that is, I think, a comprehensive, a comprehensive approach. And his his attraction to the mistake mystique that Bucky talked about, which is the idea that if you're paying attention, there's no such thing as failure. There's always an increase in knowledge. It's not a good or bad thing. It's not oh, I succeeded. I, uh, you know, and a lot of people <clears throat> like when he, you know, and it. it when he built that first dome out of like uh, Venetian blind like material and it collapsed, all the students were depressed and Bucky was so happy. Everybody said, why are you happy? And we said, well, we learned that doesn't work. You know, and it was like, now we can try something that might work. And so I think, I think a key word for him that he began to use more and more was universe. And, and he began to really often lead with that. And, uh, in talking back and forth with CJ, it's that sort of omni, uh, well, I keep saying omni, but it's macro comprehensive, micro incisive is the way he phrases it. But omni comprehensive is also, also works, you know, love is omni inclusive, love, you know, there, there are all these sort of the whole shebang kind of thing that that I think is an aspiration. It wasn't like it was even humanly possible for one person to do it, but he truly did, I think, believe in a hive mind that was connected by what he called mind versus brain. And so the he used to define environment as everything that's not you, but universe is everything including you. So universe doesn't exist without your existence. And that's when it begins to overlap with, I think, the Gita. And um, and apparently when he met some people in Bali, some of the priests there, they felt he, they had a lot in common with him because he would, but he, but he also paid attention to the details. And he could really, Allegra made this clear to me that he could really dial down into the details. So when he, he, uh, he, he sort of walked away from the 4D tower house, he immediately began to get the ideas for the geodesic dome. It was like once he gave up that thing, which he decided wasn't going to work, not that it wouldn't work, but he he was frustrated by the way uh, 
certain things got involved and there were you know a lot of disappointment on both sides about that that house and and why it happened why it didn't happen but allegra said as soon as he let go of this house that he was frustrated with suddenly the geodesic geometry began to explode in his head and he was able to move to the next step which was a better model of totality and comprehensivity than the 4D tower house, which was sort of a, a pole with a tent hanging from it. It was all made of aircraft materials, but it wasn't the, uh, the bigger it gets, the stronger it gets the geometry of the, of the dome and uh, coming out of the uh, icosahedron. And so universe was an important word because even his great aunt, uh, Margaret Fuller, in her book on women in the 19th century, you don't get very far in that book and she starts to talk about universe and and i began to meditate on that because i was working on another project based in boston edward bellamy is looking backward and working on an adaptation of that and when i visited boston for the first time i realized it sort of modeled it sort of thought of itself as the hub of the universe and i and then i realized every bostonian thought he was the hub of the universe that's just what bucky grew into you know, the, the transcendentalists and, and the transcendentalists were influenced by the German translations of the Bhagavad Gita and some of the other things. And that sort of fed into the uh, Thoreau and Emerson and those people. So and, you know, Boston's formed like um, a hub with spokes of a wheel, the streets or circles around spokes that come from a, a center. And when you grow up in that geometry, uh, that sort of really affects his life. So, uh, and so that, that even I have heard the trans American transcendentalist movement defined as a group of people who had nothing in common, but they agreed to disagree and to keep talking to each other. <laughs> you know, and I think that's really interesting. They were really a diverse group of people who had very different hits on a lot of different social and uh, political and religious and even day-to-day -day issues, you know. Uh, and then the women had their own hit on the transcendentalists. And it was like men who couldn't pay their bills. You know, the women transcendentalists had a very much feet on the ground approach and uh, apparently wrote some fairly interesting critiques of the impracticality of many of the transcendentalists. Uh, that they had to marry skilled women so that their house could run effectively and that their kids wouldn't run wild you know i mean they were not the most practical men uh so that's a uh, you know we were talking about that earlier today the the in the goethe faust group the the male female balance and that the totality of ideas is, is important uh and so that, that's sort of uh You know, and Bucky, the other interesting thing is that he was always curious is a word people have used. Uh, and I, I think he would, when I remember him speaking, and I saw him speak when I was a freshman in college, 1968, the world was exploding. And he reminded me, all over the world, Paris was exploding, Mexico City was exploding, America was exploding in demonstrations and riots. And, Bucky would just walk in like your grandfather and tell you, you know, we can fix this. We can just take this apart and work on it and, and, and we can fix this. And uh, it was very inspiring to a whole generation where they were receiving the news saying, I don't know, these problems are just too big. We just can't tackle these problems. And uh, they're just so big. And I don't know why racism persists. And I don't know why the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Well, it's just too big to tackle. And, Bucky really gave us tools to sort of break it down and put it back together again. I mean, I think he was constantly playing Humpty Dumpty. The things was falling off the wall and he was putting it back together again and falling off and putting it back together. And that was a breathing thing that was very important to him, that expansion and the contraction. And the picture you're using has him holding his arms out, which is a Qigong move. And it says the Qigong people say, you can't remain angry if you hold your arms out like this, because it means you're about to embrace something or somebody. And that's very much Bucky, you know, that, you know, he, and people spoke to that. I mean, he was deeply flawed in a whole range of odd ways, but many people would just 
meet him for the first time sitting next to him on the plane, and they just felt like they were talking to their favorite grandfather. And when I walked into the room and saw him, he reminded me of my Mormon bishop grandfather in his suit and his vest and his, you know, all put together and his glasses. It was the same glass. I just bought them because I may remount the play. And they're these glasses with the metal frames. <laughs> <laughs> and my father had a pair kind of like this. My grandfather had a pair like this. And later when I saw Bucky speak, he had a pair of glasses like this. <laughs> and I was at the College of Creative Studies in Santa Barbara, where my brother was a painter. And uh, I showed this to uh, uh, my clowns earlier today. This is a, a Christmas ornament my brother made after studying with Bucky at the College of Creative Studies, and he tried to integrate symbols from all the world's religions into this. And by the time my brother made this, he was a pretty strict atheist. But I, I kind of used to call him the atheist saint, you know, because he was just, you know, really like kids, and he would teach them music and basketball and, uh, you know, and just make his tools available for them to work on. So there, there's a there, there's pretty obvious five pointed stars in this, but there are also implied six pointed structures and hexagons and <clears throat> different things that you see in Islam and Sufism, which I'm not sure my brother knew much about that at that time, but he certainly knew about symbols from Islam and different, which were very geometrically oriented. So. Uh, and this is sort of like Bucky's ideas are not do what Bucky did, but he gives you some tools, these little elements, tetrahedron, octahedron, uh, icosahedron. And once you sort of really study those tools, the individual can do anything with it. And my brother, an atheist, loved Christmas. <laughs> and he loved buying gifts for kids, and he makes a, a universal Christmas ornament out of it. So God, Doug, in, in honor of the... Uh, World Cup, can you show the soccer ball? Oh, yeah. Uh, what I did with that. Oh, here it is. It's right by my hand. This is the soccer ball, which is also the pentagons and hexagons. And, uh, and uh, I always thought this was similar to Bucky's ideas, but apparently this design for the soccer ball was informed by Buckminster Fuller's geometry. So you just come up with an idea and people like go crazy with it around the world. You know, all kinds of memes start to come out of these very simple elements. And it's also the truth. The comprehensiveness is getting to the truth. And this is where he's surprisingly like Gandhi, because Gandhi's autobiography is called The Story of My Experiments with Truth. And almost any book Bucky wrote could have the same title. These are this year's experiments with truth. And then the next year he writes another book because the truth is modulated for him a bit and it's gotten bigger or he's gotten a fresh angle on it. And he didn't give speeches. He would think out loud in front of an audience and he would because he would pay attention to the audience and to the room and 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 then listen and say what do these people need to hear and and sometimes he'd go into a completely new idea live in front of an audience because he was actually dealing with reality moment to moment and that's what i i tried to recreate in the play and that sort of attention is also what students would go oh he's really thinking about the same things we are that every kid wants to tackle the biggest problems. Why is there war? And so he tackled that problem and came up with a range of ideas and reasons for why that continues to persist. But th those were, um, I mean, I think even though half the time you couldn't even understand what he was talking about when you listened to him speak, you would go about 15 minutes going, I don't get this, I don't get this. And then suddenly you realized you jumped on the train of his thought and you were following everything he was saying. You know, it was just like you'd finally caught the train and it, boom, it swept you along and, and you could follow what he was saying. And that's also what I tried to do in the play. It's the play is written for the audience to be confused at times. And then like a kid go, I get it, I get it. I understand that, that makes sense. Or that's funny, or that may, moves me, or that's, in fact, one woman who was around the theater a lot when I created this play 
when she was younger, she got impatient with the family stuff, right? I hate that. I like the science and the ideas and the philosophy. And then 10 years later, she helped produce it at San Jose Rep and she brought it in and she was a mother by that time. And suddenly the science bored her and she was, the family stuff just knocked her out, you know? And so it's like the play, you come at Bucky from a different angle at a different time and he's completely different. That's how comprehensive it is. And Scott Easton, who died a while ago, uh, and I didn't discover his book until I was in Poland. This is how weird things happen. He wrote a book called American Dreamer and Sacred Geometry. And in his intro, he actually says, Bucky was a one-man symposium. You know, the way some people are a one-man band. He was a one-man symposium. He could do, this hour he could be talking about economics. That hour he could be talking about poetry and art. And this and this hour he could be singing a song. It's like he's also a one-man sort of Chautauqua. He could do it all, you know. He danced badly, as Allegra said. He sang like a foghorn, which all of his family testifies to, but he was not afraid of singing or dancing. And uh, he credits Allegra with teaching him how to move during his lectures. And that, and as somebody told me they saw him at an event at a gym at UCLA, and he was chasing a huge beach ball across the gymnasium floor. <laughs> Oh, which is an image that just sticks in my mind, that he had this joy. I think there was a lot of Tom Sawyer about him, too. One of the productions I was reading, Tom, Tom Sawyer, and I realizing there's a lot of that just eight-year-old bravado about Bucky, you know, that was going, wow, this is cool. Wow, this is great. And it's... Uh, and and achieving the inner child, not the inner child, but the child's approach was for him a very difficult difficult discipline. How do you return to seeing the world without being filtered by everything you've been taught? How do you just actually witness what's going on? And I think I'd had the idea to write a play and I finally quit You know, the specific form of my job at a, running a theater because I'd gone deaf, dumb and blind and I'd gone a year without thinking much about the project and I was retreating to the mountains and I was in the mountains long enough to relax the way Bucky would go maybe to Bear Island and relax and watch nature. And suddenly I'm, I'm looking at the ground and I'm seeing the little stones and pieces of grass and sticks and weeds and much in the way I remember looking at the pattern of plants in my grandparents' lawn when I was like one year old. I was on my stomach looking at this fabric of life in the grass. And I was out there. I was there for two weeks before I could look at the ground and see it that way, the way I had as a child. And that was a major insight into what the play was about. And I began to then regather my eyes, ideas around the play and took a lot of long walks, which Bucky was a big walker too. If you take long walks, you approach things from different angles. You, you, you go through one way and you see a tower in Balboa Park where I was living when I wrote this play and in the desert. And then you do a circle around the park and you come back and you see that tower from a completely different angle or you see the trees from a different angle. And so the play became the circuitous route approaching his ideas from different angles. And... Um, had a lot of the repetition that many people say you should be terrified of in the theater. But in fact, with Bucky, he always returned to things, but it was a variation on what he'd said before. And so it became, with the variations, it became more comprehensive. So I'll, I'll leave it with that. Wow. Wow. Uh, Doug, this is so incredible because, you know, I see that's, you know, you, you can have taken in Bucky and you can almost recreate him, you know, <laughs> almost. Uh, it's just wonderful. It's just wonderful because there is no, uh, you see, human beings are complex and it is very difficult to actually see how they live, you know, how, how their consciousness operates, how their body bodily movements is shaped by that. And what you have done is that you've taken so much of Bucky within you that you are able to express and, you know, uh, show us this. So I really look forward to your participation next year. You know, we, we're going to be doing this. So I, you know, just anything that you want to do, I would love to have you do, do anything. Um, 
I want to make just one point here that you made kind of at an early the connection between mm -hmm. uh, religion and this. Um, I want to bring up this one point and then we'll go to the next uh, next um, question about the challenges of comprehensivity, both obstacles and how do you manage the immensity. Um, Phil was talking about Eric Orbach. Eric Orbach is the deepest thinker that I've seen on language, on how the his history of language. And what he was pointing out is that there is a classical style and there is the um, kind of pedestrian style. So you do kind of comedy with this and you would do like tragedy with this. And the, the lower style, so higher style and lower style, right? the higher style would be full of forms and full of kind of, you know, the way things are to be said and all of that. And the lower style would be just talking about uh, things, everyday things, but looking down upon them and making fun of them. And that's, these were the two things too. And what Phil was pointing out and what uh, Arbok was pointing out is that if you look at something like the New Testament, see, I'm a big fan of Gospel of John. When you look at John, right? Which style is it? Actually, it is both. It is the most, the highest abstractions concretized. If we are studying chapter 13, Jesus, you know, takes off his outer garment and starts to wash his disciples' feet. This is an everyday scene. This is a carpenter washing a fisherman's feet. But in that is the deepest message of equality, of the value you place on each individual being. And it is being carried in concrete, in a simple action, which is profound. So it is simple perceptual action on one hand that you can see, and it is just blowing you away with, with the depth of that. And that marriage of the highest of conceptions with everyday life is what comprehensivity can do. Um, so, all right, let's go to uh, the next question, which is about the obstacles. So we can deal with both of them together. Now, we've just said that comprehensivity is worth pursuing. What, how do you, what are the obstacles in the way of doing that? What are the challenges in order to do that? How do you do that? Um, so the how of comprehensivity. How do you overcome the obstacles? And how do you manage the immensity? Go ahead and type an exclamation mark if you would like to answer the question. Uh, we'll start with uh, Robert. Robert, go ahead. Um, I think the immensity of comprehensivity um, encourages us at least to think of it as an ideal. It's not uh, a reachable ideal, but it's one that has an, uh, a goal that you can play the game of halfway to the goal line forever. But in that process of doing that, knowing you're never going to reach the ideal, you still use your um, system of measurement and so forth, your judgment, and decide along the way you're there close enough, this will do, this is adequate, this is sufficient. And it, it's a learning lesson of how and when and why you make that decision and 
again, knowing that it's imperfect and there are going to be unintended consequences anyway that you're going to have to deal with once you've made that decision. So it's part of the whole design process to understand that about comprehensivity. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Robert. Next up is going to be uh, Jordan, Rupali, Joe, and Maritza. Jordan. I would say with in regards to the obstacles to comprehensivity, um, to embrace the concept of dignity in difference so that we view the obstacles as rocks in our river. Occasionally we engage, occasionally we simply navigate around, but they are basically always welcomed in the neighborhood because they do modify, modify the orbits of the flows of how we navigate. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Jordan. Next up is Rupali, Joe, and Maritza. Rupali. So um, I just want to add uh, one thing uh, to DW Jacobs. I want to say, you know, uh, I, I work at a school and our students make um, three-dimensional spheres with origami. And we have quite a few of those globes hanging in our school. Um, so your brother's uh, uh, sphere made me think of, of that. Uh, I think the obstacle is um, also in the preconceived notion of education that when children are educated, they, the prevalent system is very um, compartmentalized and it doesn't teach the children to think of things in as a whole. They go from parts to the whole. And if by high school, the child can form an idea of the whole, then that's great. But most children lose interest by middle school or high school because they can't see those puzzle pieces fitting. And so really examining the uh, prevalent education system and saying, is this really helping children think comprehensively or are they thinking in silos? Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rupali. Next up is Joe followed by Maritza. Joe. You know, actually, um, as soon as Jordan actually had spoken, I, I immediately thought of uh, the impediment to action and advances the action. And the, you know, uh, what stands in the way becomes the way, essentially, uh, which is Marcus Aurelius, is the obstacle is the way. <laughs> so that's the that's the whole approach with that. Um, and that, yes, that it, it's how you handle these types of obstacles is essentially, you know, uh, is defining, is how it defines you. One of the things that, coming back to that very point, um, I think one of the obstacles can be yourself. You know, that's one of the biggest things that, you know, uh, when you're becoming a, comp you know, trying to become a comprehensive, this is, and I agree with Robert, it's an ideal. It's something that you're constantly striving for. But in that process, uh, you have to be self-aware. You have to really understand your weaknesses, your strengths, and really figure out a way to maximize your ability to learn. Um, and that we've talked about that here many times about complementing yourself with people that can help, help you with your weaknesses. And you have to be willing, and Ray Dalio talks about this too, acknowledge your weaknesses, you know, be a hyper-realist and then make sure those goals are in line with reality. Uh, so it's a whole process, you know, it's having values, it's having goals, and then those initiatives, all of those things have to be in line with reality. But then again, you also have to surround yourself with people. And if you don't have that ecosystem, and if you don't have that community, that you're starting at a disadvantage. Um, that's one of the beauties of coming here. So I think that that's one of the, the things when I think about obstacles is that uh, people 
either, you know, they get in their own way by not admitting their weaknesses, or they don't have communities like this, uh, where they can get, you know, uh, essentially uh, have their weaknesses exposed. One and, and just a, you know, one of the things that there are many things that CJ has pushed me on, and when I felt uncomfortable, uh, and um, there and it's and and it's not one on one time. It was it was quite a few, and um, I never regretted it, and so. You know, that's, you know, that's, um, I'm going to leave it there. Thank you. Stop, stop there. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Joe. Uh, next up, let's go to Cheng, followed by Maritza. Cheng, um, you're welcome to comment on um, comprehensivity of Bucky. Any comments you have on Bucky? As an architect, you have some experience uh, with that. So please uh, go ahead. Or you can address the question of obstacles, whatever you prefer, or any combination thereof. Yeah, actually, uh, I'm very interested to learn more about Bucky. Uh, it's interesting, you know, I never heard of him in architectural field. I'm very surprised. And, you know, we have a different name mentioned we learned in architectural history. And I'm quite curious because he seems be such visionary and has such big impact in other, you know, philosophy, other part of the world. So I'm surprised didn't mention in architectural history. But anyway, uh, I want to say, I think the reason, you know, the education like La Poly mentioned, you know, is so broken down and they are so specialized. I wonder is, is that intentionally designed for the society system because it seems people don't want Maybe somebody in the society don't want people to understand the whole structure, the whole problem. So they can easily be deceived or driven by the marketing, you know, all the other things, you know, I, and uh, there's no incentive in the system to educate you. And that's why I think Joe mentioned it's so important to have a community to help each other to learn because there's just so much to learn. and well. Uh, I was cooking <laughs> earlier, I couldn't even, <laughs> there's so much other things to take care of. It's just almost impossible to learn on your own, you know, even though you try to do it. So I think that's another challenge to be able to do it. And the group will really help. And for the society, there's no, no incentive for the people who, you know, manage on the top of the pyramid. They have no incentive to let everybody understand the, the bigger picture. They just want you to understand the small picture and you just be the nail to work with the big grand machine. Mm -hmm. And as the people, in order to empower us, we have to understand to, that's why I think it's very, um, that's why I'm very excited about this theory because um, I'd like to learn more. And, and I think it's, it's empower everybody to understand the big picture and it's hard with this, all the other things going on in the life. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, so Cheng, we are going to be looking at the operating manual for the spaceship Earth uh, next week. And the chapter two, I think, of the operating manual is about the birth of specialization. And it talks exactly about this point about how specialization, it's really, really fascinating. So, uh, and we've done, you know, the entire series on it. So the, the, it's available on YouTube as well. Uh, so, uh, and, and I am just delighted to have you participate in this because, um, you know, Bucky is an architect and you have got good insights. You know, you, you did wonders with, uh, you know, Howard Nelson's, uh, the design way, all the, uh, all, all your presentations were amazing. So really look forward to your participation. Thank you. Uh, next up is going to be um, Maritza. Um, so uh, comprehensive learning involves us studying more and more, um, you know, broader ranges of topics and seeking different sources from many different things and uh, traditions and uh, because of 
these explorations, we will invariably find contradictions or um, ambiguities. And I, I think that this is one of the, um, the, you know, maybe the difficulties of comprehensivity is that as we actively work towards, you know, increasing the breadth and depth of our knowledge, we have to be very careful to ensure that we're pausing long enough to integrate the things that we're um, studying and learning in order to um, avoid, you know, maybe analysis paralysis is what, um, you know, CJ introduced us to. But if we don't stop to ensure that we've integrated what we've started to learn, then we're not so much embracing the concept of comprehensivity because things will get compartmentalized. And if there, if there's that kind of dissonance, it's going to hinder the ability towards striving towards um, increased comprehensive um, learning. I think that um, the, the interesting thing, however, is that we can actually use our striving towards comprehensivity as the, the answer actually to this, this dilemma that we'll find is because if we but practice shifting the manner in which we view things, we can allow these ambiguities and um, the dissonance, we can allow that to become a learning moment and we can use them as tools to help us organize our learning process and you know, we can, in that way, we can kind of expand and then keep moving forward to seek more depth. Um, so while I think that it's a, it's a huge issue that all of us will struggle with as we um, continue collaborating for um, comprehensivity, it's also, we already have the tool to help us get through it. And I think the collaborating part of comprehensivity makes this like danger as it were, makes it less dangerous because if one is seeking comprehensive learning by oneself, we have a greater chance of getting stuck somewhere. The nice thing is if we're collaborating for comprehensivity and we find ambiguities or we find um, incompatibilities in something we're studying, we have a group that we can reach out to and we can say, can I run this by you? Or can we discuss this? Or just come here and ask questions, right? And that, to me, that's that's what makes the it shine. Like, you know, comprehensivity is a fascinating concept. But then when you add collaborating before it, that's the goal. And that's, to me, that's actually the key to all of the different um, you know, pitfalls that we've identified thus far today, I think that that one word added is what gives us, we already have the tool, the, that collaborating, the collaboration will make it easier as we, we move forward because it's, it's also like, think of having like, I don't know if anyone has siblings, right? It's so much harder to be convinced that you're like absolute hot stuff when you have a sibling because they have zero issues telling you you're all right <laughs> or or much meaner right? right and so all of us together and it's and it's also it's this the basic concept of if you sit by yourself and there's no one telling you that you might be in error you tend to get a little full of yourself and it even if it's not on purpose we will keep running forward with some incompatibilities that will not be allowed to continue living within us when we're interacting with someone else because that will come to light. Like if you studied something and then you come to collaborate with others, you'll see 
the dissonance and it'll help you restructure and internalize it. And also the collaboration part, in order for one to answer what is comprehensivity, first one has to kind of internally analyze what is comprehensivity to me. And if one hasn't done that, the very simple act of speaking it out loud to others is an integration within oneself. And it sharpens the focus and the understanding. And so just that simple, I spoke up in this forum and spoke to you, now it's become an integrated piece of my comprehensive learning. And I have more space for additional comprehensive learning because now I've shaped that in a way that is more um, integrated. Thank you. Wonderful. So uh, I need to wrap it up, uh, but uh, Jordan, quick comment, please. Go ahead. Yeah, very quick. Jang brought up a great comment about she never experienced Bucky in architecture school. And it reminds me of then the obstacle of the silo that yes, it's nodes, knots, confluences of particular ideas, but the problem is it precludes leaning into dissonance. And it reminded me of how few psychologists in their college upbringing uh, have never heard of Carl Jung. And I think that's so wild because I think Carl Jung is similar to Bucky in that sense. And so just that, that Jang brought up the obstacle to me of the silo, she never experienced Bucky in college. And wow, look at the complement to that in, our, in psychology colleges where they never mentioned the word, words Carl Jung ever. And so that, that just one little piece there. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, thank you, Jordan. So um, the way I, I think about it, um, I think the way in which we are even formulating this question is from the modern perspective. And therefore we see this as, a, as something, as an obstacle to overcome. That is just the way in which we formulate the question. There is something, something uh, wrong about that. Um, let's take Gita, for example, or you can take Gospel of John, or you can take Tao Te Ching. What is, how do they approach it? Because that's like seeing an external, a very different perspective. They always focus on the whole first and accept the whole. You know, reality is what it is. Okay, I am. The universe saying I am. And you listen to it. You listen to it. And you have the same thing within you that can actually respond to it. Bhagavad Gita holds the same thing. It's like Brahma, which is the I am of the universe, and Atma, which is the I am of your core, core of your being. Um, the same in Gospel of John. It is God the Father and your capacity to say yes to him. See, that it actually, this is a very dramatic way of saying, are you going to say yes to the wholeness of what is there? And then you are what you are. You always look at it from that perspective. The moment you start to say, no, 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 I am this. And that is really, really important. And who cares about rest of the world? That's what the implicit thing is. That is what ego is of saying, you're attaching yourself. Like Bhagavad Gita has a concept of attaching, right? You are attached to your habits, to your surroundings, to the entire social system of which you are a part, your place in the society, your feelings, you're all attached to it. So, you don't see that is that there is this whole right, right around you. It's it's everywhere. Uh, so it's a very different way of looking at it. So it's all you have to do is to lose the fear. All you have to do is to, you know, lose the ego. 
and be open to it. And it doesn't mean that you are everything. You are what you are, but you are in everything and you have the capacity of responding to it. But then you have to actually say yes to it instead of saying yes to anything that you can hold off. Because that is saying, that is preferring form over function. So when you put it that way, suddenly like it, it dissolves as a problem, I think. It dissolves as an obstacle because you're seeing, uh, it, it is on one hand, a profound act of humility of accepting your limitations. On the other hand, it's a profound act of ambition of saying, you know, like the, the way in which Bhagavad Gita says, Tattvamasi, you are that. So it's saying the God in you. And you are focused only on that and not on any manifestations, not on the 10,000 things, but on the Tao in nature and the Tao in you. So it's a very, this is a very unmodern way of thinking. The modern way of thinking is to try to build a whole out of parts. This is a way of seeing that the parts are manifestations of the whole. So it's a different direction. So, um, all right. I want to tell you about uh, things that we are, we are doing. Uh, so firstly, on the Bucky series, next week, we are going to be looking at the operating manual. Joe will be leading that. A week after that, on the 18th. So 11th is going to be operating manual for Spaceship Earth. I will be announcing it shortly. 18th, we are going to do critical path. And that's the one that we are going to study. So for each of these, again, the format is the same. We'll first invite everybody who has read the book to talk about what they got from the book. Okay. Operating manual is actually very, very short. You can <laughs> listen to it within just probably less than two hours, maybe even less than that. You can listen to the whole thing. Okay, it's very, very quick. You can read it very, very fast. And it really does a fantastic job of capturing the core of Bucky's ideas. So I recommend it very highly. That is my introduction to Bucky. You know, that's the one that CJ recommended to me. So I, I read that and did meetups on that. I don't know how to learn anything by, without doing meetups on it, by the way. So that's what I do. Because then what happens is no matter how much I think I've studied stuff, I realize that when I try to speak it out, when I hear other people speaking, the, the density becomes just so much more. The, you know, you, you understand so much more. So, um, so that is the week, uh, next week, the week after that is going to be the critical path. There is another very special meetup that we are doing this Wednesday. We are continuing our meetup on the 16 intellectual virtues by CJ. So CJ, those 16 intellectual virtues actually captures something like good 70, 80% of what he has done. One way or the other, it, it connects to that. So it's really the core way of looking at what CJ has done. So even if you have not read it, before I invite you to come this Wednesday, I'm going to announce it shortly. It is the meetup is already there. I'm not put the text there, but it is going to be on the 16 intellectual virtues. We did one meetup on that. We voted for our favorite favorites on that, and we went through three of them. So we are going to go through maybe another five. So that's the that's the pl plan. And um, Doug, could you read out? that quotation to close out the meetup for us. Well, my favorite, one of my favorite lines from Bucky is unity is plural and at minimum two, which also means it can be the 10,000 things or the 10 million things or the 10 trillion things. You know, it's like, uh, it, it's just such a wonderful little line of poetry. Unity is plural and at minimum two. Beautiful. On that note, folks, Thank you. Thank you very much for being here. We'll see you soon. Bye, everybody. Good night.